healthcare system. Well, Marisa, thanks so much for inviting us this morning, and uh, Felicity, I enjoy very much listening to your presentation. Um, I'm a pediatrician over at Cincinnati Children's, and for many, many years, I've been caring for kids who present with child abuse and neglect. And uh, I would say that um, my practice changed significantly for me in 2012 when there was a position statement published by the American Academy of Pediatrics linking adverse childhood experiences to uh, toxic stress, to the experiences, uh, the experiences that they have as kids uh, being explained in, in that way activation of the stress pathway. I believe, Dr. Felitti, did you? I can't hear you. It sounded like a huge echo from here. Can you hear me in the back? Um, Dr. Felitti, I think I heard you present the A study at a pediatric conference in Philadelphia. I was a very young man at that time. And I remember you telling us that the uh, effects into adulthood went beyond uh, risky behaviors, that it was unknown exactly why the link with adult disease and early death existed, but that it did exist. And I remember walking out of that plenary session, shaking my head, thinking, oh, this man is out of his mind, <laughs> because why would experiences during childhood put one at risk for heart disease and pulmonary disease and cancer? And what changed for me was the analysis that actually we now have a mechanism that stresses the pathway, or at least one of the pathways, that likely result in these be genetic, these neurodevelopmental, these immunologic changes. And so since 2012, I have tried to incorporate the ACE knowledge into my practice at Cincinnati Children's and to figure out ways to incorporate that within many of our child-serving organizations, including schools and preschools, uh, social service agencies. So, the, so this work is still ongoing. It changes really slow, which is something that you talked about this morning. And I think that it will be tremendously helpful if we can demonstrate that our efforts to change the way that we care for children, the environments that we create for children that compensate for the stress that they're experiencing will actually make a difference. We, we need data to show that the kind that, that just like Dr. Cooley mentioned, talking about ACEs, does that make a difference? We need additional studies to show that it does or if it doesn't. I'm working with a parenting organization to bring um, a new uh, parenting or enhanced parenting assistance into pediatric practices to see if by uh, creating more of a nurturing environment and reducing the stress within the home can help build resilience against ACEs in children. But the evidence still needs to be built that in fact this is efficacious and it will improve outcomes. Good morning, I'm Christy O'Day, and I'm a family doctor, um, and I work at Crossroad Health Center, which is a federally qualified health center here in Cincinnati, um, and we serve a, a predominantly inner city uh, poor population. And I will just start with a disclaimer that I am no expert here, and so I'm very honored to be here, and I would say that this study was by far a practice changer for me, um, and so it's great to be here. Thank you for asking me. Um, how did this change my practice? Well, also in 2012, I was working at the Good Sam Free Clinic, um, which is also an inner city clinic here in Cincinnati. And um, within the course of one week, I had three of my patients die somewhat suddenly. Um, they were all in their 40s. Um, one died of metastatic prostate cancer, one died on the table of a massive heart attack, and the other had a stroke and died. And so I had, they had many risk factors, and I, as a somewhat new family doctor to the area, was pretty, I was pretty upset. 
Um, and I was just kind of racking my brain to think about what did I do wrong. And I was scouring their charts to make sure I was giving them aspirin and statins and what, you know, what had I done wrong, what had I missed. And, you know, I was really doing everything right according to the guidelines, you know. And I realized that all three of those patients had shared with me that they were survivors of childhood trauma. And that was kind of one of the things that they had in common. And so that's when I kind of starting, started doing more research and I read about the ACE study and like I said, that was kind of then a practice changer and it kind of made sense to me as to how uh, my patients who had struggled with these things, how these things could happen to them, despite me working with them to kind of try to follow all those guidelines. So, so at that time, I started um, utilizing the ACE questionnaire in my practice. Um, we, I do not give it to all my patients at this time, but at that time I started giving it to those patients where um, it seemed like no matter what I did, we weren't making progress. So if I had a patient with diabetes or hypertension and I kept seeing them back month after month and they weren't getting better, then I'd say, well, let's give you this questionnaire and then we talk about it. Um, and I found that it really started making a difference for me when I worked with those patients. So I, I think of a patient um, back in 2014, I had been seeing Donna for a couple years. She would keep coming into my practice with severe depression and she had severe reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is severe pain of her left arm. And it, it really felt like she would come in and she just kept crying whenever I'd see her. And, and again, no matter what we did, she didn't seem to get better. And we didn't really seem to connect very well either. I knew there was things going on, but I was kind of missing them. Um, so I asked her to complete the questionnaire and I just used the one I just use a one-page questionnaire, um, have the patients complete that, or have my MA help them if they um, have low literacy issues. Um, and her ACE score was 8, uh, which as we saw is very high. Um, and so we talked about it and she shared her story with me. Um, and ever since that day, our relationship just completely changed as a physician and a patient. And she had not shared those things with anybody before, and she shared those with me. And um, we were able to offer counseling. She went in to see counseling and therapy, and she has really changed her life around since that time. Now, can I say that was because I gave her that questionnaire? We talked about it. I don't know. But I do know that there's lots of, I have lots of stories like that, that just that process of the patient kind of explaining to me what has happened to them um, and us talking through that and kind of affirming that they have done the best they could to deal with those things and that those things are going to affect their health now. Um, but moving forward, we think about how are some ways that we can manage stress besides eating, besides smoking, besides using substances. How can we help her deal with stress? And so um, now I saw her last month and actually one of her siblings had recently died and she, she was actually doing amazingly well. She had built so much resilience. She was going to church, she was volunteering and she was able to deal with a lot of um, stressors in her life in a much more positive way. So, um, and that reflex sympathetic dystrophy that she had been battling is resolved. I don't know what happened. I don't know how to attribute that, but it's just not an issue anymore for her. So um, kind of thinking through, I've been very amazed at what happens in my practice. So, but I would say as a primary care physician, um, it is challenging to address these things in practice because those initial conversations with patients take a very long time. So if I give this questionnaire to somebody and they come back positive, um, it's a long discussion. And in primary care, we have about 15 minutes for most visits. And most of these patients already have many chronic diseases to deal with. So that is really a big barrier is just you know, that, how do, how do I as a primary care physician deal with that 
issue. So I'll, I'm sorry to take up too much time. Pass it over to you. I think it's the epidemiologist of the panel I'm supposed to go last. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Every Child Succeeds, the, the home visiting program that is managed by Cincinnati Children's Hospital but uh, implemented uh, in uh, Northern Kentucky and Southwestern Ohio, of which I'm Scientific Director and Dr. Folger's Director of Evaluation and Epidemiology. Every Child Succeeds began in 1999. Uh, we've seen over 26,000 sort of mother-child uh, uh, Diet since then provided over 600,000 home visits, and we've had a, a, a dedicated evaluation process and data collection system uh, from the beginning, so we have data on, 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 on all of these. Through most of our history, we have measured uh, interpersonal trauma. Uh, we did this through the first uh, 10 years of the program, took a brief hiatus, and have now come back to it. And, uh, the ACE questionnaire is administered to uh, all of our mothers at this point. We've had a number of uh, research studies funded by uh, the NIH as well as other organizations. Uh, I can't think of a single one where we didn't measure interpersonal trauma uh, in some way, including the use of uh, the, the, the ACE questions. So this has been part of our uh, sort of thinking uh, from the beginning. We published our first uh, article on uh, uh, trauma experiences in childhood among mothers participating in our program in 2002. And I've probably produced a good 30, 35 uh, additional articles that, that incorporate trauma as an important uh, driver of the phenomena that we're, that we're seeing. It's also influenced uh, our uh, practice. Uh, the home visitors, we have over 100 home visitors who provide uh, these services to mothers who join us during pregnancy. Uh, it is a prevention program. Mothers are seen in the home and are supported through education and teaching and helping moms get linked to other services in the community. And the families are seen up to the point at which uh, the children are between two and two and a half. So there are lots of opportunities uh, to talk about trauma, uh, to, to help moms understand what has happened to them and what that means, uh, but also to do some of the kinds of things that Dr. Ferlitti was mentioning uh, uh, towards the end of his talk, uh, uh, teaching parenting skills, teaching coping skills. Uh, and, and, and we found that over 75% of our moms have some kind of interpersonal trauma experience in the first 18 years of life. So most of them have it. Uh, and uh, this particular prevention program, widely distributed around the country, all states uh, have it. And uh, 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 it's, I think, a great opportunity for us to do something about it. I just want to quickly mention two things that we, that we do, partly in response to trauma, but certainly that incorporates trauma. We have a depression treatment program called Moving Beyond Depression. 